Good afternoon, everyone. Let's get this banner out of the way. All right. Thank you for joining us and welcome to the PAC chat. I'm Felicia Malelli, board chair for NJ5 PAC. Today I'm joined with Marin Gelinos, uh, one of our board members. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. We created this platform to give our community the opportunity to meet influential people in our state who share in our passion for health freedom. As part of the PAC's endorsement process today, we are joined with a special guest, Senator Mike Testa of Legislative District 1. We'll bring him on in a few minutes, but I first would like to give you a little bit of a background about NJ5 PAC and our endorsement process. If you are new to learning about NJ5 PAC, we are a political action committee, an organization made up of passionate and experienced advocates who have come together in a grassroots fashion to help influence the political landscape in New Jersey. I'm sure I can speak for all of you and all of us that when it comes to policy making in the state, we, the people, are left feeling more and more helpless and disempowered. This feeling has accelerated in the past couple of weeks, even as we are seeing more and more mandates being implemented and our freedoms being removed. So our goal in forming NJ5 Impact is to change that, to give you, the people, a voice in the arena where we are increasingly feeling like this uh, power, um, our, our voices are not being heard. So how does a PAC work? The PAC collects contributions from individuals like you, and then those funds are pooled together and implemented strategically to influence key campaigns in the state. And uh, as a PAC, our, our goal is to see candidates into office that align with our mission. So they are able to be a voice for us in Trenton on issues that matter so much to us, like health freedom, bodily autonomy, informed consent, parental rights, and uh, everything surrounding those issues. And J5PAC and its contrib uh, contributors believe that all decisions making them, um, believe all decisions making that, I'm sorry, excuse me. And J5PAC and its contributors believe that all decisions making it when it comes to um, health and medical choices should be left up to the individual. We encourage you to visit our website for more information, events, and to read our full mission. I'm going to pass it along to Marin, who's going to share with you more about our endorsement process. Thanks for tuning in, Marin. Thanks, Felicia. Welcome, everybody. So I'm just going to go over quickly our endorsement process, because that's one of the reasons why we're here today uh, live on the PAC chat. So just so you understand how our endorsement works at New Jersey Five PAC, we've come up with a set of standards, our board members. We've come up with these standards uh, to measure political candidates to determine whether they're eligible to receive an endorsement from our PAC. And we use things like our survey that we've created. We use the candidate's voting record, if there is one. And uh, also we would use conversations with the candidate and determine their positions on matters that affect our mission as a PAC. So we do this um, endorsement process and do it with as much integrity and measurement without any bias. Our goal is really to provide as much transparency around the candidates that we um, endorse to be a resource to the voters to provide um, help provide our knowledge and expertise around where votes are supported and warranted again that are in line with our mission as a PAC. So when you see our PAC seal of endorsement, you can be you can rest assured that the candidate is for our collective mission. Um, our previous endorsements that we've done up until this point and future endorsements can all be found on our website, which is www.njphipac.org slash endorsements. So go there and check out all of those candidates we've already endorsed, and you'll find um, some future endorsements as well as we move forward. So back to Felicia. Thank you, Marin. Okay, so now that we've cleared up that process, I'm really excited to introduce our next official endorsement, Legislative District 1, Senator Michael Testa. Congratulations, Senator. We Thanks, are uh, 
Good afternoon. Um, Good I, afternoon. I was so surprised that, you know, a pack based on medical freedom would be interested in endorsing me, you know. <laughs> it was an obvious choice. Um, of course, you um, sail through our vetting process with, with flying colors. Uh, we're also excited to in, also endorse Assemblyman uh, Simonson and Assemblyman McCullen, who could not be joining us with us today. Um, but um, we're happy to have you here with us, Senator. So on behalf of the PACS board and the health freedom community, we wanted to extend a, uh, our gratitude to you for your con continued courage and um, allegiance to this issue that matters to so many of us. And thank you for being there to help preserve our religious freedoms and our parental rights um, unconditionally. Oh, well, thank you. It's been an honor. Um, you know, since I got into the legislature, I was voted in in November of 2019, as you're aware. And I was a, a substitute for the health committee on December 12th of 2019 when the religious exemption issue uh, came up in the health committee. So, you know, um, I was sort of thrust into the legislature and then this issue was placed squarely in my lap serendipitously because it's not a committee that I was actually assigned to. I was a substitute on that committee. And, you know, I, I want to thank your community for bringing a lot of attention to my office very early on. And, I, you know, I still think of the speech that I gave that day, which was based purely on liberty. But I also sort of made the joke that I didn't even have a phone line at the time. And yet, so many people who were very concerned about their religious freedoms and medical freedom in general were able to contact me. So, you know, I just want to thank the people that are on this are on this Zoom or on this call. You know, they are heavily involved in an issue and they've made their voices heard. And, and it's just really nice to see people exercising their First Amendment rights, coming to the state house, coming to places like Rutgers. I, you know, I've seen many of you and recognized many of you at many of the appearances that I've had in Atlanta, you know, Atlantic City, Rutgers, the State House, numerous times. It just is really great to see people that active in the process, uh, especially when, you know, they present themselves as your PAC always has and your PAC members always have in a, in a civil, professional manner. And that's and that's really important, um, you know, that you've, you've brought a very professional face to this movement. Yeah, it was important to us after um, you know, 2019 to get a seat at the table. So that's why we formed the PAC so that we can be a bridge to our community um, for legislators such as yourself to, you know, humanize you and to um, also then give that validity that you're behind us and help them to have a guide of who to get behind themselves on election day, such as is fast approaching. <laughs> Sure. I mean, and look, you know, I don't want to be the one to like sort of hog the limelight here. This has always been about the team for, for us in Legislative District 1 and myself, Eric Steinmanson and, and Antoine McClellan have been really well aligned on this issue. Um, you know, we have a number of constituents who brought this specifically to my attention a couple weeks prior to the election in 2019. You know, I was aware of the issue. I didn't know how quickly it was pending. Obviously, when you're running in a race and it's your you know, your first time running for office, you're focused on on the, on the win. And obviously I was attacking uh, Governor Murphy at the time heavily. I called it the Murphy midterms and it was the Murphy midterms. And we were very proud of the fact that, you know, we were the first legislative district to flip from one party to the, the Republican party in 28 years in the state of New Jersey. So that's really what we were focused on. And, you know, we were the only Senate seat flipped to Republican in the entire United States in 2019. But, you know, I want to thank the individuals who brought this to my attention. It was, you know, Katie Sarnoff and Christina Walls, who were really the first folks that brought the issue to my attention. I want to thank the members of this PAC, whether it's, you know, Marin, Felicia, Rula especially, has, has always been heavily involved in getting me information, um, you know, so that I can make a, a sound and informed decision. And I can tell you, each of your PAC members that have communicated with me have never been pushy they've just provided the information and allowed me to make the decisions on my own and we, and we really appreciate that excellent well we appreciate you oh, thanks and I, know, I know um you know we were in the health committee when you stood up and you really spoke from your heart in that health committee and you were you were just a fresh face and it wasn't even your committee and you stood and and spoke from your heart for the thousands of people that were there 
And uh, we really appreciate that and we'll never forget it. Well, and, thank um, you, Marie. You know, I, I attacked it from a, a position that, you know, that obviously involves my legal background, not necessarily from what, you know, many people like to be dismissive of, of the medical freedom community and say that they're a bunch of anti-vaxxers and things like that. And, and, I, and I don't like labels like that at all. I don't label the other side that way, um, my, my opponents that way. It's, that's a very dismissive way of, of putting things because, you know, yes, you are under a medical freedom umbrella, but there are people that have, you know, obviously religious beliefs and other f folks are just based on pure bodily autonomy. I, I came at it from a liberty perspective. And I know some people weren't necessarily thrilled that I wasn't all the way there with them on, 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 on the issues of, of vaccines. But what I said was, look, that's a decision. I, I'm, I'm still perplexed, by the way, that the that the that any community would want their legislators to be making medical decisions for them. I mean, I think those decisions should be made between their doctor their, or their medical professionals and family members with informed consent. I mean, I think this is a basic notion of informed consent. And what I said was, you know, in that committee, and I still remember it. And Marin, it was from the heart, and it was the, the single issue that I focused on when the issue was first presented to me was was liberty. You know, in our state, if God forbid, when someone is driving while intoxicated or suspected of driving while intoxicated or under the influence of some narcotic and they get into a, an accident that causes serious bodily injury or a fatality, you know, they need to get either consent to, of the individual to pierce their skin and draw blood to perform a test to determine whether they were intoxicated or they need to get a judicial warrant. Yet, you know, contrast that with the fact that the state now wants to be able to pierce a child's skin against the will of their parents without informed consent. I mean, I have a real issue with that. I mean, and I don't think that those two positions can stand and, and, and coexist together under the umbrella of legal protections that we typically have as Americans under our constitutional rights. So I have a real issue with, with that. I still have that same issue. And, you know, again, I think that, you know, there's a whole lot more common sense that can be injected, no pun intended there, um, in, into this conversation. Um, but unfortunately, there's been mass hysteria in the era of COVID-19. And, you know, people want to have mandates and things of that nature. And it just it really goes against the basic notions of informed consent, of liberty and common sense of what's happening here in the COVID-19 era. Right. Yeah. Thank you. And we really jumped into that. And we're going to get back to a lot of that medical freedom, um, what's happening really right now in current events. But we have, you know, a lot of our viewership and contributors know who you are. But um, for those of our viewers that are new to this movement and to you, I wanted to just give them an opportunity to hear from you and how what you touched a little bit about, about the law. And if you could just go into a little bit more about what your profession is and what really was the impetus for you to get into politics to begin with? It's a great question, actually. Um, so, I mean, we're going to have to go, we're going to have to start at the beginning. I had a college professor that said the best place to always start is the beginning. So we're going to have to start at the beginning. Um, you know, I'm 45 years old. I'm from Vineland, New Jersey. I'm born and raised here. Um, my grandfather was a mayor of the city of Vineland. He was actually the first elected mayor of the city. Prior to that, it had been a borough and a township uh, growing up. You know, your, your typical Italian Sunday dinner, uh, you know, politics were discussed regularly. I, even though I was at the kids' table, I was a little bit nosy. Uh, my father was the city chairman for the Republican Party of the city of Vineland for a number of years. Uh, there's sort of, for my family, it's an iconic picture. I believe it was 1981, so that would have placed me about, you know, six years old or so. I, I was shaking the hand of candidate Tom Kane prior to him being governor Tom Kane. Um, so, you know, I, I, I sort of grew up in politics and I always knew that it mattered. Um, and, you know, in 2007, I became heavily involved in my county party, which I would encourage many of your of your viewership to get involved in you know, at the county committee level volunteering. That's how you know, that's pretty much how I started. And I, I became the solicitor for my county organization. I believe it was 2007. I sort of moved up the rungs of the ladder to vice chair. And then in 2014, I ran for chairman of the county organization and was successful. And I have to tell you, I saw a lot of campaigns that were run that could have been won, in my opinion. I mean, you know, I don't I don't think I'm coming from a pompous position there. I saw a lot of campaigns that I think could have been won had had people 
played a little harder. And I say this about my party that we have to take off the white gloves and put on either the work gloves and sometimes the boxing gloves. And, you know, far too many races were run what I call soft. And there's a saying that I learned along the way. I forget exactly where I picked it up, but it's a political saying that I think is the best statement that's ever been given to me about politics, that you don't beat vanilla with French vanilla, you beat it with chocolate. And I saw far too many French vanilla campaigns. So what got me involved in, in running for, for the Senate in 2019 was I, I thought that South Jersey needed a change and it was right for a change. And look, you have to realize like, you know, in order to get elected, there has to be proper timing and proper opportunity. And th there was sort of a confluence of both of those things for me, which I was a great beneficiary of. And then we were able to assemble a phenomenal team of me, Eric and Antoine. And we were told that we couldn't do it. I mean, we were absolutely told there's no way you're going to win this race. Millions of dollars are going to be spent against you. And 11 days prior to the election, we were supposed to be down 14 points in the in the only public poll that was done by Stockton University. And guess what happened? I won by seven points. So it's it's proof that if you run a serious race and you're willing to lay it all on the line and, and leave it all on the field or on the court, whatever you want to say, and you stick to issues, you can win. And and we we ran a very conservative race. We we kept punching at Governor Murphy's what we believed were radical policies. And I still believe that they are radical and they're getting more radical as, as time goes on, that they are radical leftist policies that don't make the stronger and fairer New Jersey that Governor Murphy keeps talking about, but it makes New Jerseyans weaker and poorer. Yeah. <laughs> Very interesting. Yep. I'm, I'm sure most of our viewers uh, agree with that at this current moment. <laughs> Um, but that that's great. It's a great story. And thank you for sharing um, how you started. And uh, we're, we're so blessed that you were so successful <laughs> to be here. Well, it, had, had I not been, I can tell you that, you know, that December 12th hearing, you know, placed me squarely on the map. And I've taken a lot of heat for that, by the way. Uh, and I don't care. I mean, it's just that's the way it goes. If you're going to take a stand, uh, that, that's what people elected me to do was was to take a stand on a number of issues, not just medical freedom, but economic issues, uh, whether, you know, no offense, I know both of you are what I, from what I consider North Jersey. Um, you know, Marin, you might be from Central Jersey. I don't, you know, I don't know that I agree with that, but, um, you know, it's, it's, no, it's North Jersey, um, especially to us in District 1. You know, we really ran on the fact that Southern New Jersey was always neglected by Trent and they love taking our tax dollars each and every, you know, each and every day, but we don't get anything to show in return for it. And, and that's a shame. And, you know, we we need a, a more improved way of life down here. We need a better economy. So those were really the building blocks of the issues that we ran on. And, and, and people agreed with us. Yeah, great. So I'm going to jump into um, some more of the current events that our viewers are really interested in sure. at this moment. Um, I can't so, imagine what they would be, Felicia. I really yeah. can't. <laughs> Let's go. So it's really is this one thing that I want to particularly talk about first, but it's it's what's happening at the state house. Recently, we learned that there was um, legislature was con being considered as a measure to require proof of vaccination um, or COVID uh, a COVID test to enter the state house uh, capitol building, um, and uh, even that it may have passed committee. So uh, can you update us on what the latest is on that and how this will affect the people of New Jersey? Well, it's even going to affect legislators. I mean, that's that yep. that's that's the truth of the matter. That's going to affect, you know, people like myself from being able to to do their job that the people elected them to do. I mean, I think it's, you know, I, I said it before, and people were very you know shocked by what I said. I said we are going to create a segregated society when we when we talk about vaccine passports and vaccine mandates. You know, I, I'm I'm not for that. You know, I compared it to the Dr. Seuss book, The Sneeches. And, you know, people think I'm always cheeky and making a joke and things of that nature. You no, know, this is real. I mean, you know, that there's a reason that those that a book like the Sneetches was written and it was supposed to teach children that segregation is really bad and it causes problems. And that's what's happening, you know, in our state. And what's even worse is, is if, you know, if we actually look at the statistics and my party always gets accused of not following the science, not following the statistics, is that these vaccine mandates or passports are going to even more adversely affect minority communities who are far more vaccine hesitant. And it's proven that they are far more vaccine hesitant 
than the Caucasian population. That, that's a real issue, you know, and that's something that I think is being short sighted. And, and quite frankly, I mean, I, I think, you know, to, to draw an analogy to this niche is the medical community should be given a gold star because the fact of the matter is, is that this was created to prevent you from coming to the state house. Your voices have been heard so, so loudly, and, you know, and, and no offense while we, while we were conducting business, maybe a little too loudly, yeah, but you know, um, I get it. Everybody's very passionate about the issue. Um, but, you know, I, I, and what I mean by that, it was just was loud in the, in, in the room. We couldn't really hear each other, each other talk or think, but that's OK. Everybody was is very passionate and heated about the situation. But, you know, this was this was targeted specifically to create to prevent each and every one of you from coming to our committees. There's no doubt about it. I mean, you know, and, and to me, the state house is the people's house. It's not for legislators. It's not it's it, that's the citizen's house. It's for us to conduct business. And everybody should be there and respect the fact that we are there to conduct business. But you're supposed to have access to it. The people of New Jersey pay for that building. You should be allowed to have access to that building. And, and the, the fact of the matter is, I'm very concerned about this. And what, what really bothers me even more so about this policy is that it doesn't even take natural immunity into account. And again, my party always gets accused of not following the science. Well, what's more scientific than achieving natural immunity. You know, we, we talked about Judith Perzicelli, who I'm sure, you know, each and every one of you and your listeners know who, who that is. Her goal was 70% vaccination rate. We've achieved that. We've achieved that in the state of New Jersey. So she's achieved her benchmark. So now we're going to prevent people from conducting regular business. I mean, COVID's going to be here for a long time. Are we supposed to continue to just have shutdowns and mandates? We're not going to be able to mandate ourselves out of this era. We're simply not going to be able to do that. And, you know, I, I think it's a real issue to, to segregate a certain population that either has natural immunity or is vaccine hesitant. That's that, that's a real problem. Yeah, you are shadowing exactly what I have been wanting to portray to our community. I hope I've been doing that. And that's explaining what four more years uh, in with this establishment will look like, because for me, one of the greatest issues in this now is, is you know, we, we always talk about bodily autonomy and health freedom and parental rights, and it's that. But now we've stepped up, stepped in an, another um, component, which is the segregation and discrimination. And all we're doing, so when when all the, you know, we were at, at the state house in 2019, and I, I remember someone turning to me and saying, look, this is coming. It's in China right now. It's going to come. And she's somebody, whoever it is, re referenced passports in ideology, not necessarily said passports. And, you know, r right there, I said, you know, we're, we're, that's when the rumbling started. Okay, well, what's going to happen? What is, how is this going to transpire? And it's been the threat that they were going to just mandate it, one blanket mandate. Well, no, that's not how it's happening. It's just peeling back the onion. We're going to restrict this community and then we're going to restrict this community and we're going to stop you from coming in here. And then the, the, the private sector is going to take it upon themselves to make those decisions as, as if they were really not uh, coerced into doing so. Um, so it appears that that was just their, their right to say, you know, you can enter into this restaurant or you can't right, enter in this restaurant and it, it is a private business, but, but that's how it's happening. And now we're seeing it in the state house. And I agree with you that state house is taxpayer dollar state house. That is our house as uh, the people of New Jersey. And now we're going to be um, restricted in it, our it, in entering. Felicia, if I may, I mean, you know, you're bringing up some phenomenal points. And again, you, you know, again, I, I said you have to start at the beginning. You know, my legislative district in July of 2020, so, so supposed to be the height of the COVID-19 era, not only in the United States, but specifically the state of New Jersey, we accounted for less than 2% of all COVID-19 positive cases in the state of New Jersey. And Governor Murphy, in his infinite wisdom of authoritarianism, thought it was a good idea to have a blanket policy across the state. Well, if you've ever been to Cape May County in the summertime, they rely on a summer economy. I mean, now we have what's called a shoulder season, which which has basically, it's really from Easter to maybe Thanksgiving. I mean, that's so, so it's extended. And that's only some of the, the, the towns who have really taken advantage of it. But they rely on the summer season to make their money. And Governor Murphy did not take a scientific approach. He took a, a totally unscientific approach 
to the entire state. He took a blanket approach to the state of New Jersey when we had less than 2% of all cases. And many of those businesses at the Jersey shore could not su survive. You know, I mean, we, we clearly stated, and I sued on this issue, that the governor was in the business of picking winners and losers by deeming some, you know, some businesses essential and some non-essential. I held a press conference in May of 2020. I mean, think of how long ago that was. It was supposed to be 15 days to flatten the curve. May of 2020, I hosted a press conference at a female owned business called Coho Brewing in Middle Township, where at that time you were only allowed to have takeout beer. Well, if you've ever been to one of Jersey's great breweries, yeah, you're allowed to sample to determine what you want to buy and take home. Across the street was Home Depot. There were over 200 cars in the Home Depot lot on that day while I was giving the press conference. So, I mean, the governor is responsible and his regime is responsible for over 30% of all small businesses shutting their doors forever. That's the blood, sweat, tears, and life savings of multi-generations of families literally taken away with the swipe of a pen. You know, and me sitting in the legislature, what did I do? Myself and Senator O'Scanlan had a plan for over $300 million in relief for those businesses. That was denied. Uh, myself and Senator Doherty wanted to actually have the legislature in the discussion we came up with a bill that I thought made a whole lot of sense. It didn't prevent the governor from issuing new emergency orders, but it allowed a 14 day review of every emergency order, executive order coming from the governor. And we could either say yay or nay to it. That was denied. So, I mean, you think about it, the Democrats in Trenton actually voted to take power away from themselves in the legislature. I mean, that's unprecedented history. And yet you don't hear, you don't hear the press grabbing onto this issue, which they should be, because you had other states that, you know, of course, Governor Murphy says states like Florida, you know, are the dark ages. You don't want to go into the dark ages. I mean, guess what? Their, their businesses aren't shut down. The, the beauty about freedom is, is that you could choose not to go out. If you were, if you were so afraid of COVID-19, you could stay at home. Sweden, we saw what happened there as well. You know, Governor Murphy refused to look at any other examples nationwide, or worldwide to determine whether his policies were a, were a good policy. And at one point in time, if New Jersey were a country, we had the, the highest death rate in the world if, if we were a country. And we still, to this day, have the second highest death rate in the country. So again, obviously his policies didn't work. Yeah, I think I can um, speak for some of our community when we say that generally we are a more faith-based community and that it's over fear. And and the approach that you're speaking of was more of a fear-based approach, a blanket approach, not considering, you know, county by county or, or other or other means. But it's just important to note that if these issues uh, affected you, bother you, you know, you, you need to see change. Obviously, you know, now is the time. The elections um, have started. The, the polls are open. Um, they are select county locations. So um, I'm not sure. Do you know the exact um, amount uh, in your county, in your uh, district? There's there's several locations in your district. There's three in Cumberland County alone. Okay. So you just have to go. There's the, the websites in the ticker uh, to newjersey.gov and um, or, or just simply Google uh, New Jersey early voting locations and it'll pop right up. It'll be the first. That's on um, your ticker right now, actually. Too. Yeah, okay. It's right there. So Perfect there, there are six total in my legislative district, just so you're aware. There's six total in my legislative district. Excellent. So there's there's options. And, and I'm old school. I'll be there on election day um, to, to, to vote for myself and my team in the entire ticket, obviously. I mean, you know, you brought it up, so I, I'm, I'm gonna Go I'm gonna run with it. I'm gonna take the ball and run with it. Sorry, you know, every year you hear politicians speak and the talking heads on on television speak and say this is the most important election ever. This is the most important election ever um, for for New Jersey. It really is. And you know, for those who have criticisms of the top of the ticket, I don't. At this point in time, um, we can't allow the perfect to get in the way of the good. We can't allow the perfect to be the enemy of the good. There is a stark contrast. So when I said earlier about you don't beat vanilla with French vanilla, you beat it with chocolate. This is as vanilla and chocolate as it gets. You have someone who is a tyrannical governor who believes he doesn't need that third separate but equal branch of the government in the legislature. That's Phil Murphy. 
And then you have Jack Cittarelli, who actually understands how important that third separate but equal branch of the government is because he was a member of the legislature. He was a member of the assembly for three terms and he gets New Jersey. Um, you know, I, I happen to be personal friends with Jack, so I, I certainly want him to win. And, you know, New Jersey can be can be changed. New Jersey can be fixed. But right now, you know, it's not just about medical freedom. And that's a super important point. But New Jersey is the most taxed burdened state in the entire United States of America. We have the greatest outward migration of citizenry in the United States of America. We have the worst business climate in the United States of America. And if we don't have the, the worst, we're one of the worst brain drains in the United States of America. I have three children myself. Um, they, they can't leave yet because they're too young. But, you know, I want them to at least con consider New Jersey as an option when they go to college or to a trade school, whatever it is that they do. I, I want them to consider New Jersey an option because, you know, I live pretty much around the corner. That's that's South Jersey around the corner, which means like less than 15 minutes, by the mm -hmm. way. That's not doesn't mean literally around the corner. But I live around the corner from my parents, essentially. And it's great. My, my children get to see their, their grandparents regularly, that we get to eat together regularly. You know, I, I've said this during the 2019 campaign. Most grandparents in the state of New Jersey, due to the outward migration, see, see their kids, their grandkids by, by telephone, by FaceTime. And, you know, unless it's a major holiday or a funeral, they're not the families aren't getting together because, you know, the children have gone off in the diaspora of the state of New, you know, of the United States of America to a much more business friendly and tax friendly state. I mean, it shouldn't take a brilliant mind to figure this out. It's common sense. But when you're, you know, when you're a multimillionaire like Governor Murphy, you don't really have to have common sense. You can have these pie in the sky uh, liberal notions and you can have a $10 million villa in Italy that, you know, every other governor, by the way, this really sticks with me. Every other governor since I've been alive takes pictures on the boardwalk in the summertime because they go to a Jersey Shore hangout and, and, and take a vacation. Not Governor Murphy. He goes to Italy. I mean, you know, I mean, think of how out of touch one has to be when you're from Jersey. You should be in Wildwood, New Jersey, Seaside Heights, someplace in the state of New Jersey, walking the boardwalk, eating boardwalk pizza, eating a custard on the boardwalk. That's what you should be doing. Look at Governor yeah, but Murphy. Isn't, isn't that, I have to interrupt, isn't that because that was your childhood? Because that's what you know. Oh, oh my gosh, we just lost Felicia. We lost Felicia. <laughs> <laughs> now I get to talk about like, you know, maybe there's a conspiracy theory to get, you know, to bumper off of, of the, uh, all, we're all, all, getting, all, we're all, all getting hooked up. Well, yeah, you know, you know, the pack is a book. Huh? We, I hope she's able to get back on. I, I, I'm sure she will be. She's, she's covering the back end. So hopefully she'll get back on. I, I don't, are we still live? Hopefully we're still live. Um, I believe we are. Well, you know the pack. You know we love Jack Cittarelli. We've we he was our first endorsement in the general election, and um, I love the fact that he brings balance. I think, I think that's what New Jersey needs. New Jersey needs balance so that we can get back to getting things done for the for the majority of people. I think there's a lot of very unhappy residents of the state, myself included, a lot of my friends and family, and um, I think we do need somebody that has common sense that is balanced in their approach. And um, I really do hope that everybody gets out to vote because this is going to come down to voter turnout. And we know that. Uh, and, and Marin, you bring up a phenomenal point. So less than 40 percent of all eligible voters voted in 2017. And that's why we have Governor Murphy. Um, you know, for whatever reason, there's, you know, voter suppression out there that, you know, when people aren't thrilled with the gubernatorial candidate, they stay home. We right. can't have, we can't afford to have New Jerseyans stay home for early voting or on election day. We need New Jerseyans to vote because yeah. it really matters. I mean, you know, the course of New Jersey may be altered forever because of the, the imprint that Phil Murphy is leaving. I mean, you want to talk about, you know, some things that, you know, I, I say are insane and people say to me, Michael, you know, that's kind of a strong word. You know, do you really mean insane? And I say, yes, clinically, you know, uh, and, and it, because I mean it. When you look at the energy master plan, you know, that, that's that's beyond the pale of anything that is really sane and sensible. What it's going to cost every single New Jerseyan if the energy master plan is followed to the T. We're going to have even more outward migration. You know, and I and it just it boggles my mind. Right. 
that this that this governor thinks something like the energy master plan, which I call the energy disaster plan, you know, people said, don't you think it's ambitious? I said, ambitious, it's pie in the sky. I mean, it's it's a it's a, a liberal's dream. You know, I mean, it's, it doesn't even make any sense. I mean, about, you know, cars being electric, converting your natural gas to electric. I mean, it, you know, we don't need to look very far to other states to see that there are brownouts and things of that nature that when you rely solely on one source of energy, you have a problem, yeah. you have a problem. So, I mean, yeah. there's far reaching issues, not just the medical freedom. And that's certainly a, a very, it's, it's a telltale sign of what he's about, right? The medical freedom issue is a telltale sign of what Governor yeah. Murphy is about. And that is he believes he's your ruler. He does not believe that he's your governor. I, I think what we've lost with this administration is, is public health policy. Our public health policy is literally forcing a vaccine, coercing people to take a vaccine in order to participate in society. And, you know, the science shows that this vaccine is to protect the individual from serious complications and death. OK, so why are we restricting people from from the state house and from from jobs and and potentially from school? You know, that's not public health policy. Let's encourage people to get the vaccine let's educate but where is the public health policy where's the trust we're, we're not building trust in our government entities there's just no trust anymore marie and you bring up a great point and I, and I and i said that so this is really interesting that you brought that word up so early on in 2020 cape may county the board of chosen freeholders then what they were called now the board of commissioners came up with a long-term policy that was you know a ramp up policy to allow businesses to open, schools to open, society to open. Imagine that. It was early on during the novel coronavirus as it was then. Look, I'm, I'm not going to lie to anybody. I mean, you know, everyone was pretty scared when this first hit our shores. We weren't, we weren't exactly sure what was going to happen with COVID-19. Right. We were told 15 days. We all did what every New Jersey and pitched yeah. in. We did what we were supposed to do. Cape May County came up with a phenomenal opening plan. So if you know anything about re the real South Jersey, as I like to call it, Cape May County and Atlantic County, due to Atlantic City, are the number one and two tourism districts. We need tourism just to function. So Atlantic County reviewed the Cape May County plan, adopted, 100, adopted it 100% verbatim. So the casino industry had their own plan, which really mirrored those two plans, the, the Cape May County plan and the Atlantic County plan. That plan was given the stamp of approval by Senate President Sweeney for reopening. This was a bipartisan plan. It has collected dust and languished on Governor Murphy's desk since then. Yeah. Think about that for a second. And what I said early on about trust is our captains of industry, you know, whether it's the casino industry in Atlantic County or the hospitality industry in Cape May County, there has to be a level of trust from the government to those captains of industry, to those business leaders that don't want to harm their patrons, harm their employees and lose their business in the process. Right. And you, you, you have to have that level of trust to allow them collectively to navigate this, not just shut them down and put them out of business and say, you know, yeah. um, you know, we're creating a stronger and fair New Jersey while, you know, while you just put hundreds of people out of work and sure. it, you know in atlantic county i mean not my, not my district but i'll talk about it Thirty thousand people were unemployed with the swipe of a pen Thirty thousand. i mean think about what that does to a county's economy that relies so heavily on one industry right. that's just quite frightening that there's that much power consolidated in one man right. that's scary right right yeah we we there needs to be a balance where we're keeping the public safe, but at the same time, we're not causing even more devastation to people's lives, right? We want to protect them from a virus, but at the same time, we want to protect them from, you know, being able to feed their family, just having their job security and, and, um, really, really basic stuff, Marie. Really right? basic. It's like and, human and, rights. Yeah. And, and, and also, you know, you think about the, sort of the dichotomy between the public schools and the private schools that we saw. You know, yeah. we're still dealing with major issues with children suffering from anxiety because 
they've been they've been listening to all of this fear mongering. And thank God that children have not suffered the severe ill effects of COVID-19 and have proven not to be super spreaders. You know, I have two of my children that are at a parochial school. There were four cases all of last year. They were they were in school while we had, you know, my, my oldest goes to a public school. It was fully remote. Yeah. You know, that's that's not OK. And, right. and many kids were not participating in online learning and remote learning because they couldn't. And in my district, we had real issues because we suffer from rural poverty. Some of our more rural communities, the kids couldn't even log on because there's no broadband. I mean, you know, I, I know in North Jersey, that's not even an issue, right? I mean, but in, in my district, it is an issue, a, a severe issue. And, you know, kids were going to, you know, Walmart parking lots, McDonald's parking lots, Starbucks, so they could log on and do work. You know, this this wasn't, and we're, we were a year into it, and these issues hadn't been addressed yet. And we couldn't even do anything in the legislature because we we're just taken right. out of the equation. Right. Yeah. I do have a hard stop in a couple minutes, just so you know. But ah, uh, okay, <laughs> we're like completely off our outline, so I don't even yeah. know where. What, what do you want to talk? Do you want to tell us what your? I mean, we we've, had, we've heard your passions, but like when you do get reelected, what are you going to be passionate about championing? Is there like one specific thing that you want to take on um, when you get reelected? Well, I mean, there, I'm not more more than one. I mean, broadband. I mean, I had a bill for rural broadband in june of 2020 uh, it went through the senate i'm you know i'm i'm faithful that it's going to go through it's that it's going to go through the assembly it needs to go through it's it's, it's a necessity it's no longer a luxury i think we've learned a lot from the covid 19 era where there are some major gaps in our society um you know obviously our budget is a major issue in the state of new jersey we're not on a sustainable budget right now you know under governor murphy our budget has been grown by 11 billion dollars um, you know, I was the lead attorney on on that budget lawsuit, by the way. That was something I'm very proud of that went before the New Jersey Supreme Court. I'm not thrilled with the result. Um, originally, Governor Murphy wanted to borrow, we'll call it $10 billion. It was $9.9 .9 billion. Uh, they had to certify that any amount that was borrowed was directly related to COVID-19 and necessary. They borrowed $4.6 billion, which is an astronomical number. Guess what? We told them they didn't need to borrow that because they had grossly underestimated revenues. And it was determined that they didn't need to borrow four point six billion dollars. So that's an issue I'm very passionate about our budget. You know, yeah. New Jersey needs to tighten its belt, not loosen it. I mean, yeah. follow the money as well, because we know that um, very clearly that a lot of that money is going toward um, districts to enforce their compliance and uh, help roll out plans for, uh, you know, vaccination, tracking vaccinations in the school systems, I'm speaking. Um, and the, and other issue, the other issue, Felicia, is what I said was, we knew this was going to be a lot of money borrowed so that Governor Murphy could, could play Santa Claus in an election year. And that's exactly what he did. That's exactly what he did. And only in New Jersey can you borrow money, borrow money. You know, if you borrow money for your house, that's a liability, right? In New Jersey, somehow it randomly becomes revenue. So it, it's included in our revenue stream. That's, that's a, it's a real problem and is, is now in our $10 billion surplus. It's not a real surplus. We don't really have a surplus in the state of New Jersey. I sit on the Budget and Appropriations Committee. Governor Murphy can call it a surplus and, it, and you can go through mathematical gymnastics to make it a surplus, but guess what? It's not a surplus. So, I mean, that's those are real issues that I'm passionate about. And, you know, I just want to get New Jersey back on track. And, I, and I'm looking forward to working with Governor Jack Cittarelli uh, and, and making sure New Jersey does, in fact, get back on track. But I do need to go now. I, I can't thank this pack enough. Uh, let's stay in touch. Um, obviously, you know where, where I stand on these issues. And, you know, I, any I want... last word, if you can just wrap up what health freedom means to you, please just it's a liberty i mean you know it's 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 basic liberty and bodily autonomy i mean that's really what it means to me and and, and again i'm always perplexed why people would want to put the medical decisions in the hands of legislators i mean i'm an, i'm an attorney by trade i'm not a medical physician you know i mean i keep healthy i work out i take a, a number of supplements but you know I, I you know there's there's things that you should be able to talk to your doctors about and there should be informed consent um you know th that's a real big issue for me and you know i've I've talked to Bobby Kennedy. I've talked to, you know, Dell. I talked to all the people that 
are involved in your movement locally and nationally. And, you know, it's it, it's, a, it's a great thing when you have people with the bravery to stand up and say, hey, let's push the pause button on this. Why are we doing this? And what is the end? Um, so, you know, to me, it's, no, it's, it's a basic notion of liberty, Felicia and Marin. It's a basic notion of liberty that should be, in fact, protected. Love that. Thank you so Thank much. You. Right. So good Thank to see you. you and chat with you. Have a great one. Take care. Same to you. Thank you. Bye-bye. So there you have it. That was Senator Mike Testa from Legislative District 1, our endorsement for Senator Testa, um, Assemblyman Simonson, and Assemblyman um, McCullen from all from District 20, um, District, excuse me, District 1. Um, that's um, Cumberland, Cape May County, um, and one additional county that's on our ticker below. Um, so we, you know, that was a very, um, obvious district for us because of all the support the Senator Testa has given us in the movement for health freedom from 2019 to the present. He has been vocal and, and physically present when we need him to be a voice for us. And, uh, of course he's passed our endorsement process with flying colors and we are excited to elevate him and help him help his community see why it's important to get behind him, get out to vote. The um, voting um, precincts are available at the uh, nj.gov website for under early voting, where you can go and find out exactly where the local um, offices are in your community, in your county, excuse me. There's, I think you mentioned there's probably six in his district that you can go to now until Sunday. Um, and then on Tuesday, Monday, they'll be closed. On Tuesday, voting will be open as usual in your local voting offices. So, um, you know, it's it's been such a pivotal, this is such a pivotal election to the fate of religious exemption uh, and our health freedoms and our parental rights. So I would be remiss if I didn't mention that it is, that what is happening right now, currently in this moment, makes what happened back in 2019 to preserve religious exemption look minor in comparison. And it is essential to encourage friends, family, local community members to get out and vote now through November 2nd. Uh, we, we need them. We need you. And uh, please encourage them to do that. If you're interested in getting involved in volunteering, uh, please follow us on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, uh, YouTube, and um, you'll learn opportunities that we are um, uh, trying to push uh, through We the People Jersey Strong. You can actually just go to their website, we the people Jersey Strong dot, uh, dot org, and um, sign up to do some door knocking, make some phone calls. It Everything matters. It's not just about getting out to vote right now. What can you do to help, whether it's, again, talking to community members or, or doing a, um, a volunteer effort? So uh, I just wanted to mention again that, that the PAC relies on your contributions in order to be able to elevate the candidates that we need to get behind. We are a grassroots PAC. We are nonpartisan and uh, a nonprofit political action committee. So we're not a big corporation. We are run by the people and for the people. It is an organization that was set up for you to protect and strengthen the constitutionally guaranteed and fundamental rights of all New Jersey residents to make medical decisions for themselves and their families. So please continue to support us and follow us. Uh, we thank you for joining us. I'm going to, um, we're going to sign off now with a video that we created to, um, as a pack with your contributions and our efforts to uh, help support the campaign for Jack Chitterelli. I always thought I would vote for Phil Murphy. I believed that my family would be kept safe. I trusted that he would honor my choice when it comes to my body. I trusted that the small business my immigrant parents opened 40 years ago would be protected and thrive under his leadership. I believed his public health policies would be educational and progressive. I never thought that as a nurse, I would be forced to do something against my beliefs or face termination. I trusted that he would be transparent and forthcoming with the data that drives his policies. I want to see his science and data. We've been 
asking for that since last March. There is none. I never imagined that he would be so dismissive of my concerns and those of my neighbors. I believed he would leave this state with consideration for all people and do so with kindness and respect. When I voted for Phil Murphy four years ago, I had no idea that this is what I would be getting, and I refused to waste my vote on four more years of his failed promises. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Uh, we're going to sign off for today, but please stay tuned tomorrow. We have an interview with Melinda Cittarelli. We look forward to introducing her to you, our community, to get up close and personal with her. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great afternoon. Bye. Bye.